Um, well, thank you for um, bringing me here. And um, I hope you all enjoy this. Um, so uh, before I kind of start telling you about everything, I'm going to do something a little different. I kind of change these talks around all the time. I give them a lot. And so um, it's really to keep me on my toes that I do things differently every time. So, um, so I wanted to read to you um, an artist statement that I wrote recently. I really can't stand writing artist statements, but I understand that they're necessary. <clears throat> Mostly they're a source of like severe embarrassment for me because I write them and I put them out there and then the people read them and it's just awful. But this one I was actually kind of proud of. So um, I just wanted to read it to you. It covers a lot of bases and um, just keep it in the back of your mind when I'm showing you everything. So. Um, this is uh, my artist statement as a run-on sentence. <clears throat> okay. uh, if you took The Wizard of Oz and the Titanic and Frankenstein and giant radioactive ants and Beethoven and Typhoid Mary and the Lone Ranger and Snow White, especially the scary parts, and James Dean and Low Riders and uh, Stradivarius and the Second World War and my childhood and my dad's childhood and your childhood and stories my grandfather told about his home in the south of Italy and St. Francis and Frank Sinatra and a few Betty Davis movies and some Joan Crawford and some heavily glued and glittered Christmas ornaments made by kindergartners and Popeye and the Mickey Mouse Club then and now and Spider-Man, and the bones of a dodo bird, and a game of Monopoly, and a deck of cards, and Raymond Chandler, and the Black Dahlia, and the Starline tour of the homes of the stars, and Dick Tracy, and Donald Duck, and some kittens, and Tweety Bird, and Chili Willy, and the Movie Land Wax Museum, and a giant squid, and things in my pockets, and you crumpled them all up into a tight ball, and you painted a smiley face on it, you would get something close to what I think my work is like. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this, this is my family. Um, and uh, I, I, I just want to show you some things that I like. And I, I love my family. They're very dear people. Um, they've always supported me, and I really couldn't make my work without their support. Um, and so I kind of like to show people them. Um, and this picture here is one of my favorite pictures ever. Um, it's a film still from a very, very old movie. I don't know what movie it came from. I found the picture in a book. And all I remember about it was that the little baby grew up to be a director of horror films. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think I always really like the fact that it's it's a really horrible scene, you know, to think of a baby being taken away by a giant bird, and then in actuality, it's also horrible because it's a baby being carried away by a very janky stage prop. <laughs> this is where I live. Um, I live in a warehouse, and I share it with one other person, um, and it's very full. It's uh, in Gardena, California, which is right next to Compton, which is very well known for its thugs and stuff like that. It's not really a bad place to live, but um, uh, so anyways, that's, that's it. Um, I moved to, I, I didn't always live in LA. I, I grew up in um, San Jose, California, which is up in Northern California. And um, the north and the south on the west coast also don't really get along, um, and so I always thought it was a horrible thing to live in Los Angeles, but when I moved there, I really, I really loved it, um, or it kind of grew on me. These are some of my favorite things, and they're on the 405 freeway, which is a very long freeway that connects um, Los Angeles to San Diego. Um, these people, I have no idea who they are, but um, 
This is one of my hobbies where I go to estate sales and I just buy up people's old slides and I wonder about them. A lot of times I can recognize, you know, outfits and I imagine what year it might have been and I imagine what I might have been doing in that same year and um, just think about these people. Um, so uh, these two images sort of re represent um, some things that happened to me in my, in my childhood that really kind of steered me in the direction of art or becoming an artist. Um, so in this picture here, I am dressed as um, Jill from Jack and Jill, point of view. And my best friend, Michael Ress, at the time is dressed as the mouse uh, in Hickory Dickory Dock. And it was the nursery rhyme day parade in Kinnaman. And I am, oops, I am really, really sick. I have about 105 degree temperature. And um, about all I could do on that day was my mother leaned me against the garage door, took my picture, and then put me back to bed. And this was a common thing. I was a really sickly kid. And, um, but being bedridden all the time, I think it helped sort of develop a maybe overactive imagination sometimes, which is good for art making. Um, so this picture here was a picture that I drew when I was about eight years old. Um, I went to Spain for about a month um, with my family when I was about eight years old and for the first time in my life I was really exposed to um, uh, some great works of art and Fr Francisco Goya was one of my very, very, very favorites and I really fell in love with painting and I, I wanted to grow up to be a painter and I wanted oil paints for my ninth birthday. Um, so also, uh, as part of being a sickly child, I watched an awful lot of television um, when I was a kid. Um, I watched cartoons, certainly, um, but I also watched an awful lot of horror films. Um, it was mostly because of my father. He was a big fan of horror films and we would watch them together all the time. And so oftentimes themes that you find in horror films are also peppered throughout my work. Um, I also uh, had this idea that all black and white films were horror films, so I would watch all black and white films. <coughs> and it took me a while to realize that they weren't all horror films, but people like Betty Davis would throw me off sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> because she could be really scary in some movies. But I gained a kind of appreciation for um, movie stars like Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, um, and they were these really s steely kind of um, women that you really couldn't knock down, and um, they kind of outlived their own legendary status, um, and they were, I, I think, just really brilliant people to watch. Um, so these are some of my favorite places that I visited in the world. Um, I like these really unusual places and I could give you a whole lecture about all these places that I visited, but I'm just going to tell you the names. So this is um, two pictures from this remarkable place in Wisconsin called the House on the Rock. Um, this is a giant uh, sea beast being overtaken by a giant uh, squid. And this is the world's largest merry-go-round. It's two stories high and has some 80,000 lights on it. Um, not a single animal on the merry-go-round is a horse. Um, they're all kind of weird homogenizations of animals. Um, but it's kind of this weird place where it's a combination of an amusement park and one man's obsession with collecting the most of everything. Um, this is a place in uh, Albuquerque, or near Albuquerque, it's called Tinkertown, and this, again, it was just one person's life's work where he carved kind of like this western village, and he populated it with things that he carved and made, and then he threw in little um, uh, plastic toys and cutouts and things like that. It's a very extensive place. Um, and very overwhelming. 
these are things I really aspire to. This is a uh, Liberace. Um, it's a roach dressed up as Liberace. Um, and this is the Combate Motel. This is um, in, in a place just outside of Dallas, Texas, and it's the Roach Hall of Fame, and this, um, or the Cockroach Hall of Fame, and this one man who owns a, basically an extermination company um, got people to send in cockroaches that they dressed up as movie stars and whatnot, and, um, and then he keeps them all in his shop. Um, this is um, in Georgia. Um, oh, anyway, a very famous dude <laughs> whose name I just forgot. Um, Howard Finster, um, and uh, this is his home in uh, in Georgia. And uh, also, just uh, it's it's wonderful for me to know that there are people out there who have this ability to sort of create their own uh, worlds around them. So this is kind of a not so nice thing, but it has something to do with my work. I'm not sure what, but anyway, so this is a picture of a baby. And the baby died, um, uh, and this picture over here is the same picture of the baby, but the parents wanted so badly to remember what he was like when he was alive, so with the help of the photographer, they, they kind of pasted or placed it's hard to see um, pictures of open eyes on the baby's closed eyes so that they could remember what he looked like when he was alive. And it's just so precious to me that I'm trying so hard to keep this, the memory of this baby in their world. This is uh, one of my teachers, um, and he really taught me that um, uh, fine art is a good a place as any to put a practical joke. Nobody expects it, and so this is one piece or something that he was kind of really well known for. He, um, he made this skeleton and he buried it in his backyard, and then when there was a, uh, a landslide, he, um, he invented a persona for himself. He called himself Dr. Gladstone, and he went all over the country giving lectures about finding Bigfoot. And he invented this whole um, language, for, uh, kind of pseudo-scientific language. Um, he said he had found remains from the pre-credulous era. And oops, um, he invented tools that you could use to go out and find your own Bigfoot remains. Um, and he put them all into a museum that he called the Museum of Unnatural History. This guy's name is Clayton Bailey. He's not a very well-known artist in ceramics, but he's, he's really oh, a great influence for me. Um, so this is one of my most favorite places. It's not there anymore, but it was a wax museum in um, Buena Park, which is near Disneyland. Um, and it was uh, all based on movies, and um, all of the, the waxes had their own movie set to go with the movie that they were in. And sometimes they would do this thing where they would retire a lot of things and then they would just throw a bunch of them into one set. So you would have this weird conglomeration of like uh, Batman and he would be on a Harley Davidson and there would be like a victim from the Chainsaw Massacre at his feet and he would be in a farmhouse. And it would be just this really strange collection of things all together, and um, I, that's kind of something that I'm aspiring to, really. Um, so again, I'm like so impressed that people find a need for these things in their lives and then they, and they pursue them. This is, a, this is a car that has been mosaic with cigarette butts. Um, and this is a motorcycle that has been uh, modified to have a, a trailer on the back of it. And it says back here, life is hell without Jesus. Um, and I, re I just really love so much that people need these things in their lives and they make them. Okay, so here's some of my work. Um, so this is in no particular order. I've given up on chronological order because I mix it up all the time. But So these are kind of like some of the my favorite things that I've made. Um, these things 
I really couldn't have made anything else that I made today if I hadn't made these pieces. I went to Alfred for graduate school. It's a very traditional kind of school for ceramics. And um, these pieces are made out of unfired clay. And it was really hard to make um, pieces out of unfired clay and get any kind of feedback from my faculty at Alfred. But I did it, and really, I haven't, I haven't made work that was not unfired clay um, since then. Um, at the time, this is actually, there's a violin um, in this block of dirt. And there's a shoe here in this kind of block of clod of dirt. Um, and these, I was trying to make these objects look old and like artifacts. And so it seemed appropriate to me that they should be really delicate things and um, might have a very tenuous lifespan. Um, if you've seen any of my work, or usually if people know any of my work, they know me for these cars that I made. I made about six of them, and not many people know that. I, I'm not going to show you all of them, but I'll, I'll show you some. Um, this was the very first car I made, and I think I made it just to see if I could do it. Um, uh, and a lot of times my work is, um, well, it's similar to this idea. When I was a kid, I really, really, really wanted a dog. And I begged my parents for a dog, and they wouldn't give me a dog. They said, you're not a dog person. And so um, what I did instead is I went into the garage and I made a dog. I just hammered some wood together and put a face on him and then put a rope around his neck. And I took him for a walk around the block and I fed him and I slept with him in my bed. And then, then I had made the dog. I was done with it the, like the next day and on to something else. And a lot of times my work for me is, is wanting something in the world, having a desire for it, and um, finding a way to make it or put it in my life. Um, this car is probably one of my well-known cars because it was in a very, very um, uh, well, the, the show that it was in got a lot of attention. Um, it was in a show in L.A., and I really wanted to make a lowrider. Um, I don't really like cars all that much, um, but I wanted to understand better car culture, and so it made sense to me to make cars. Um, and so this car, since it was going to go in Los Angeles, I made it kind of like a lowrider, which is sort of quintessential for a Los Angeles car culture. It's also um, this particular kind of car is based on like a 5149 Mercury, which is the same kind of car that James Dean drove around in the movie Rebel Without a Cause. So it's got that other, it's a very L.A. movie. Um, and then if you're ever going to see a car with flames on it, it's going to be this style of car. If ever you're going to see a car that has been chopped and lowered, it's going to be this, this kind of car. So this is my, my lowrider and um, I put flames on it and uh, inscribed the names of all my family and friends on the dashboard. And this is a very famous lowrider. It's called the Gypsy Rose, but certainly I, I understood lowriders a lot more after I built this car. There it is in, uh, installed in the show. So these pieces are really recent and um, not the first thing that you're going to see in the room if there's a big clay car next to it. So, um, but I, as small as they are, they have a lot of punch for me. Um, okay, so what you're looking at here is not a plain card and is not a piece of cardboard and there's not a paint can lid here. This is all um, clay that is unfired and painted to look like all these things. Um, that I kind of been doing this thing where I kind of paint little collage-like elements onto what looks like cardboard, um, and I, I kind of put these things together. What I'm really talking about here is this value of 
things and um, if I were to make a drawing like this or whatever on a piece of cardboard and a playing card it doesn't have that much value but if you know that I made the playing card and the cardboard um, and did all this with paint um, it gets a different kind of value. Um, so these, these pieces are also fairly recent and um, I'm really kind of having a lot of fun with these pieces. I made, most of this I made in Georgia and um, uh, while I was there, I was kind of lonesome. I really didn't, I, I had to work a lot. I had two solo shows in the same month, one in Georgia and one in Los Angeles. So I had to really work all the time. But um, this was like a soul entertainment for me. Again, there's no bottle caps here. This is all made out of unfired clay that's been painted. A lot of times I think of myself as um, a painter who's trapped in the body of a sculptor. Like, I really wanted to become a painter <coughs> so badly, but then I discovered ceramics and I went to a school where I had to sort of commit to sculpture. So painting kind of fell by the wayside, but every now and again it really comes back and it just um, takes all the sculpting out of my work and becomes more like painting. Um, this piece here is called The Snowman's Lowly De Demise, and he's, he's being melted by S Superman who's trying to see under her shirt. Um, uh, so these, again, are not not pencils, they're, um, it's unfired clay that's painted to look like these things. And I'm really saying something too about, you know, just somebody's need to have something in their world, you know, whether it, you know, um, and the sort of casual existence of these things together in order to mean something to them. Um, so these pieces, uh, I did a series of pieces uh, after I made all the, these, um, the last, well, after I made um, that lowrider, I decided I was very quickly becoming known as the girl who makes the clay cars. So I wanted to make something big, but something that wasn't a clay car. And so I had this idea that I would make a carousel, and I would make all this, all, all these various parts. Um, so. These horses here, they, they kind of complete one another. Um, like this horse here has everything that this horse over here doesn't have. And this horse here has everything that this horse doesn't have. This horse is a dark horse, this horse is a white horse. They sort of go together. This was a lion. Um, I imagined that Popeye and Mickey Mouse would be on this carousel. And I really wanted to populate it with all kinds of strange things. Um, I ended up putting all these pieces in a show, and then um, they they got sold out of that show. And so I kind of had all the wind taken out of my sails for this carousel. I didn't want to make it anymore, and I didn't want to start over. Um, so at that point, um, I was really lost. I didn't really know what I wanted to make. I, I kind of didn't want to make the carousel anymore. I didn't want to make another car. So I grabbed the first thing in my studio that was closest to me, and it was a Monopoly game, and I decided to make it. And I was kind of really interested in hand making something that was mass produced. Um, again, this is all unfired clay that has been painted and then drawn on to be um, like the bills. I tried really hard to make everything in the Monopoly game. I didn't, didn't actually make everything, but... Um, it just alone, you know, I learned so much about Monopoly, but, um, uh, uh, and I mean, that's oftentimes why I take on these things, you know, if you ever want to learn about a subject, just pick something you don't know anything about and make art about it, and you learn a lot really fast. Um, so, like, these things are really important to me, they're goofy, and they're kind of like doodles, but the day that it kind of occurred to me, like, th this is my work too, um, was a, it was a very powerful thing because if you, so this is the 3rd of May play set and this is uh, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio on the Titanic. 
And um, these are kind of like little little toys that I made. And when you show these things next to a big, nasty, dirty car, like they really change the way that you see that car. And, um, and it changes the, the humor that you find in these when you see them uh, against a big, dirty, nasty looking car. Um, so the 3rd of May is like something that's very powerful in my work and this is a, my most recent sort of interpretation of that painting. Um, this is, piece is called Two Thirds of May and this piece went to the Istanbul Biennial. Um, and it's two versions of the 3rd of May. I made it kind of like a still life. So over here, there's sort of one of the seven doors who's being shot at by all these uh, toys and there's some dead toys over here and all these toys over here are waiting to get shot. And, um, there's also this, this other side of it, which I kind of designed these to look more like the characters in the painting, but I made them look more like toys, like lead soldiers. Um, and then I put this kind of like, um, it might be hard to see, but there's like a figure eight drawn around it um, and there's a little train on the on the train track. Um, this is another still life that I made very recently and it's called um, Mr. Bill in the Conservatory on a Silent Night and um, oops so this is um, some close-ups of it. Again, there's nothing that's like um, actual things. These are all made books. and um, This whole thing kind of started because of this one tragedy here. Um, so Mr. Bill, oh, I, I made this character and sent him to a show and then it got broken. And so just for fun I made little clay blood. Um, and then I sort of imagined this like really um, kind of strange nativity where all these characters, there's Mary and Joseph and Mickey Mouse and all these characters like run to Mr. Bill's rescue. You know, they had come really to see Jesus over here, but he fell and he was in more need of prayers. So, um, uh, and then I put it on this clue board game that I made. and. And everything else in the still life kind of has to do with this, this one little tragedy. So, um, I had been making work that really looked like it had been dug up from a lake or, you know, was an abandoned ruin for a really long time. And, and um, I made different things for different reasons and I kind of tried to look at, I always made objects and I, I tried to look at objects that I actually owned and it, I came to find out that I owned a lot of books. I don't really like to read, I think I just like to look at pictures. So really what I started to do is um, in order to be closer to this book, which is a real book, I made this book, um, which is unfired clay that's been painted uh, with paint and ink to look like this book. And it's a way for me to kind of like follow in the footsteps of that other artist or just to spend more time with these things that I already really like. So I started this <coughs> series um, that I loosely called the Side by Side series. Um, here's some more examples of side-by-side -side pieces and I would always show them with the original book so they became like this comparison contrast sometimes. Sometimes they are like a, an inseparable couple, they sort of finished one another's sentences. Sometimes I just wasn't um, good enough to make everything on the book so like um, in this case here, these these faces were too small for me to paint, so I inserted like Quick Draw McGraw and Droopy Dog, and these these pieces were very much to me like collage. But I started to make all the collage elements. 
Um, this is as big as the side-by-side -side series got, got. Um, and I made this whole table, and on one side of the table were all books and toys and magazines um, that I had made, and on the other side were the actual objects. So here are the real things, and over here are the clay uh, counterparts, and they're sort of mirrored. Um, so, um, these pieces I made around 2003, 2004, um, and I first had this idea, I wanted to make an, uh, this is after I had made my first car, I wanted to make a second car, and Cadillac I had chosen be for its sort of majesty, um, it's this, at least 59 Cadillac was very majestic. Um, so this is based on a Fiat Topolino, uh, Cinquecento also, um, and, um, and it's kind of really amazing for its economy. Um, it can drive almost any terrain. Every Italian has learned to drive in one of these cars, and every Italian has nearly lost his life in one of these cars. Um, they can, I mean, you can, two people can pick them up, they're, they're these amazing little cars. Um, so, I wanted to pair it with, originally I wanted to pair it with another uh, same kind of car, but then I read about this piano that Beethoven had owned, and um, I liked the story of his beat-up piano so much that I decided to make his piano and sort of pair this very high-end crafted thing against this very low-end, um, still a you know, well-crafted thing, I think. Um, but I was also concerned very much with the interior of this car, and so there's seat belts and seats and radio, um, and they were they were made as a as a couple. Um, so the, uh, this, these are examples of collage. Again, like a, a lot of times, you know, I desire something, so I'll, in order to have it, I put it in the world. Um, I had a friend who had died, and I really, really wanted to see um, my friend's ghost, and I, I couldn't see any ghosts, so I started making collages about ghosts. Um, and these are some other collages. I made paper collages with printed material for many, many years, but I kind of stopped because I felt it was really hard for me to make my own voice with collage, so long as I was using all this other printed material. But collage sort of dropped away, and then it comes back. So um, I quit smoking. I was like smoking for like about 20 years. And when I quit smoking, I started making these cups. I also had to stop. Um, doing anything that I would do alongside of smoking. I really like smoking cigarettes, and and um, when I turn 80, I'm going to start up again. But uh, for right now, I'm just taking a little break. But it was painful for me to quit smoking. Um, I could only have one cup of coffee a day or something like that, you know, so I wouldn't desire cigarettes so much. And I thought if I could only have one cup of coffee, it should come out of a nicer cup. So I started making cups. Um, and it also, you, you gain a lot more time in your day when you quit smoking, like you, you don't realize how much time you devote to smoking and then you quit and you have all this extra time. So I went crazy and made these cups. And I really enjoyed drawing these cartoon characters on the cups because they just, they looked as pathetic as I felt <laughs> about not being able to smoke. Um, and gradually, it just became another place for me to put this, these collage elements. Um, these are all um, little kind of like espresso cups and I made about 250 of them for um, <coughs> wedding favors for my youngest sister's wedding. Uh, and I really enjoy the collage that sort of happened when you put them all together. Uh, these pieces are um, very recent, like I made them this year. Um, and again, I think of them as collage, but I'm making everything here. So this is a piece of unfired clay that I've painted to look like a comic book. And then I've painted this sort of mudflat lady on it and all this sort of war insignia. Um, and same thing over here. This is based on an actual book. Um, 
a little golden book that I painted a piece of unfired clay to look like it and then flipped it on its side. Um, in this case too, um, well, just that one and that one, I made the tacks too. So, um, and this thumb tack is a tack that I made. It's just a piece of clay that's stuck to a wire that's holding it to the wall. Um, these pieces, again, I, I, I love this so much, you know, because it's called um, uh, Casper Between Two Cheating Aces. If you look at the aces, like the suits change here and here. So if you're trying to cheat at cards, you can just flip the card. And then, and then little Casper's kind of stuck between the two, and he's kind of in this sort of like, um, he's trying to float there, and he's also looking like he's prone to being crucified. And um, so I, it's just full of all these um, different things that I just thought are so, so great. He's trying so hard to be um, heroic, but he's just, he can't, he can't be that big. Um, same thing with Papa here, driving away this car. He's, he's trying really hard to drive this car, but it's a little bit too big for him. The car's, you know, been modified. It's got like a cardboard wheel and a paint can lid wheel that I, I made. Um, uh, and Papa is trying really hard to drive it. I made a bunch of work that was based on Snow White. I, I don't know, I think I just, I really enjoy painting Snow White. And if, it, you know, like, there's one fairy tale that gets twisted a lot. It's Snow White, and she always gets turned into a really bad girl. Um, uh, so this is called Snow White in Evening Wear, and this piece is called Weeping Snow. And for me, it's, it's really, again, just about the associations that these things make t together, and, um, and being able to spend time with these things, and, and collage, that's all. Um, so I started making these these things too. They're, they're kind of like kind of like Frankenstein uh, put together out of a bunch of different parts, um, but they make this other thing, and th they're still also you know he's trying to be really bad, but you know his little stick man body is just making a a, a dummy out of him, um, and this guy is trying to be mighty, um, but he's just kind of. He's failing at it. So these pieces I made re really recently, like yesterday, um, and um, this piece is there's a there's a record album that came out when John Kennedy died, and they they compiled a bunch of his famous speeches. So I made the record album, and then I put this little cardboard mask that I made, and he kind of really, he, he still looks like John Kennedy, but he also starts to look like the Lone Ranger, and he looks like the Green Lantern, and he, he also looks like the boy Wonder. Um, so he became like this this tragic hero, but a super tragic hero, a superhero tragic figure. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking I, I want to create this, this a kind of series about tragic heroes, but them becoming super tragic heroes. Um, this is, this is piece is called I Heart Free Validated Parking. Um, and I, I, again, you know, as I'm talking, you know, about, about the value of things, if you were to see these three things just thumbtacked to the wall, you wouldn't think anything of them. But if you know that I made these three things, um, and, uh, and they're not, not casually placed, really. They're much more complicated than they seem. Um, so this is a connect the dots that I made with uh, tacks that I made. And this is another kind of Frankenstein Donald Duck. It's very angry. Um, this, this piece here, I kind of imagined that somebody wanted to make their own money, like they, they didn't have money, so they decided to make their own. So and they based it on things that they liked. So they, they made the bank of Jimmy Dean, and this is James Dean. Uh, this whole piece is called Jimmy Money, and they kind of cut out things from a comic book and glued them on there. And this is kind of my thinking also about this piece. Somebody d doesn't even have 
uh, access to um, you know, space invaders, and, but uh, the best way that they can, they, they bring it into their life by making it out of all these, um, these are cards from Candyland and cards from Monopoly and some matchbooks and pieces of cardboard looking things. So, um, I had this experience when I was driving once where um, I was driving too slow, somebody got really upset, flipped me off and sped off. You know, that happens frequently, I'm not a very good driver, hate driving. Um, but then my thought was like, that was my one and only experience with that person and it was kind of an awful one. And I might see them again sometime and I'll go, oh, I remember you, you flipped me off because I was driving too slow, I remember. <laughs> So, anyways, I just wanted my experience with people, strangers, especially people that I might only see once, to be a pleasant experience. So I had this idea that we make objects for everybody I'd ever known. Um, so these are some objects I made for all people I had known. Um, I would kind of chew off, um, chew off big hunks of my family or people that I knew. Um, and I would make objects for them. These pieces um, were put in a show, and the show was called Objects for Everybody I'd Ever Known. Some of the objects on this table were sold, some of them were given to people that I knew, some of them were kept, um, and all of these things down here sort of inspired what was made on the table. Um, but these, this table sort of got chopped up and it, it was never really seen this way again. These are pieces that I made for people that I worked with, um, the different teachers that I worked with. Um, people start to think of you a little bit differently when you give them random gifts. Um, uh, um, sometimes they really appreciate it, sometimes they just read a little bit too much into it. Like, Why did you give me a tank? Um, and what's with the Mr. Spock? Like, why did you do it? And, um, so I, you know, I met some people were just accepted it as a gift, and um, so I still do it from time to time. Um, and uh, but these were all pieces that I did around 2006, 2007, and they were all in the objects for everybody had ever known show. And really, at the time, I was really interested in all this collage. So you have to look hard to find it all sometimes, and. Um, there was a magazine in the 70s called Highlights, and they always had what's in this picture pictures. And so um, these are kind of doing that for me, um, where they're hiding a lot of things in there, and you have to look really hard to find them. Um, so like here, for example, you have Doris Day, um, and then you have this Philip Guston hand here. You know, I quote artists who I really love. This down here, it's really hard to see, but it's a drawing that I did when I was eight years old, or no, younger than that, probably like five or so, and I was riding a scooter. Um, and uh, um, the same thing for this one, there's um, all kinds of, um, there's green eggs and ham in here. Um, there's these are the Lennon sisters that it were taken from a coloring book. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not tracing this. I'm just sitting with things and painting them as best I can. Um, sometimes my work, I think, is a little bit about repair. So in this instance, I'm, I'm trying to repair things that, that <coughs> broke or somehow went away. And with these two cups, I owned uh, a pair of cups and one of them broke. So I rebuilt the broken cup out of unfired clay and ink. And um, in this one, the Smurf cup broke. And so I rebuilt the cup out of unfired clay and ink. And so the repair job is not it's not sufficient. Um, it's sort of failing in a way, and that's something that I'm kind of interested in. These pieces um, I made uh, around the year 2000, 2001, and um, I made them alongside of making all those paper collages, and I was really interested in two-dimensional and three-dimensional collage. So there's paper in here, um, and I was also interested 
in these traditional shapes. I kind of really feel like an outcast in ceramics because um, I didn't come at it with a love of pottery. But I always felt like I was kind of closer to traditional ceramics than people thought I was. So this is my attempt to get closer to it. Um, around that same time, this was a, like a really big awful years for me. Like a friend of mine died. I'm, I had this big, uh, my way to get through all of this was just to work like crazy. So I made my first car. I had this huge solo show at a little tiny um, community college that nobody saw, but I made something like 70 sculptures and 150 paper collages, and I put them all in this show. Um, as I kind of tied the sculpture together and um, said that it was all war things that were used in a, in a symphony, and this was some crazy symphony that had other things in it like cups and teapots and bicycles and a deer. Um, but there were nine cellos in it, and so um, these are my nine cellos. Um, I, I was able to keep the nine cellos, or seven of them, seven. I gave two of them away initially, but um, and then 10 years later, I exhibit them in a show. And, um, and so this is what they look like 10 years later. But it's really out of like deep, deep sorrow that these works are coming from. So, um, uh, so they're, they're not pleasant. Um, these are some collages. Uh, again, I, you know, I'm really interested in so the, these <clears throat> books, uh, comic books, have this blue dodo bird that's sort of drawn over the top of them. Um, and these scooters, I was kind of interested in sort of drawing, kind of like, mm, it's almost like defacing it a little bit with this sort of graffiti, but then at the same time, there's, the, you know, they're kind of, I don't know, look like tattoos. I'm not really all that interested in tattoos, but um, I kind of like the way that they fit the sculpture and they, they do sort of resemble like a tattooed kind of surface. Um, this was one of the very first still lifes that I made. It was called 150 Ways to Play Solitaire. And it was based on just this book. And it was really, I was really trying hard to be kind of like the Movie Land Wax Museum where I was taking a bunch of things that didn't you know, really mean anything um, and put them all together and made these associations with them, but not really associating them at all. Um, this was the very last car that I made. It was based on James Dean's wrecked Porsche Spider. Um, this car was kind of cursed, uh, so he, he died in the car, having owned it only like about a week, and um, uh, he was not alone in the car wreck. Um, there, his mechanic was in the car. Uh, he did not die, um, but later on he did die in a fatal car accident. The car, uh, the wreck, you know, there were still usable parts in it, and they were put into other cars. And those other cars had fatal or near fatal accidents. And so much so that the owner of the wreck decided it was too weird to have these accidents go on, so he wanted to get rid of the car. It was, you know, so he sold it, um, eventually sold it to the highway patrol, and they put it on display all over the country, sort of promoting highway safety. Um, at some point, the car was being moved. Uh, the car still continued to have accidents, um, even while it was on display. And, owned by the Highway Patrol. Um, but at some point, the car was being moved from Florida to California. The truck arrived, the pink slip arrived, and the car was gone. So, um, and it was never to be seen of or heard of again. Um, so with this car, I kind of wanted to bring back this cursed thing that maybe had no business being in the world in the first place. Um, so this is my attempt at bringing back James Dean's wrecked Porsche Spider. Um, these things I kind of threw in because I don't think you're ever going to have the opportunity to see these. Uh, so um, these things, you know, I made these little things for my students that I had at, in Georgia and I kind of sent them on a scavenger hunt around the building to try to find them. And so I kind of really um, placed them within the architecture. Um, 
And so this is like just a clay head and then the, the, the body is made out of uh, tape. And this is a woman's bathroom sign that I modified. Um, these pieces, so I had two shows. Um, I, I had a show in Georgia and I had a show in Los Angeles. And uh, this all happened last February. Um, these pieces were from LA. And um, I think the thing that I love so much about these pieces is that they just, it's somebody's attempt to have something in the world using materials that they have access to um, and maybe not doing the best job. So this is called Mouse on Skates Holding a Flag. And this piece is a snowman. There's no snow in California, so I really wanted to have one. Um, there's no snow in Georgia either. Well, there is, but not when I was there. Um, this piece here is called um, Werewolf Stick Man Makes His Escape with Princess Stormtrooper. And um, this piece is called um, Flying Tiger's Smart Ass Rabbit. So, um, so I oftentimes make things that I own a lot. And in this case, I, I have this little McDonald's toy and I remade them. And I kind of put them on this pedestal together and they're having a little bit of a showdown. Um, uh, they're sort of staring one another down, but also they're just, they look completely and utterly shocked to see what they're looking at. So this piece is called Don't I Know You From Somewhere? Um, and this piece here, um, you know, this, this guy is kind of totally aware of what he is, but, uh, you know, completely, like, this, this is George Washington eating an apple and smoking a Virginia Slim. Um, and, you know, it's kind of just really awful and sad, but, you know, um, really brave at the same time. Um, these pieces I made, they went to New York. I still have them. Um, but, uh, so when I quit smoking, I, I wrote, uh, Smokey Loves You on everything, um, because I just, I believe cigarettes really loved me, <laughs> and I really loved them. So this horse is called Smokey Loves You. And um, this horse is called Sugar Dancer, and so the piece is called Smokey Loves You Sugar Dancer. Sugar Dancer is actually a name of a racehorse. I, always, I don't really like racehorsing, but um, I, I love the names of the horses. So. Um, so I think these are my last slides. Um, these pieces um, uh, also went to New York, and this is like side-by-side -side series, but I added these two little kitties, um, and they're kind of like coddling one another. Um, and uh, this is called My um, Pretty Pony. Um, this piece here is no more. Um, it was recently a victim of uh, the Sandy uh, storm, and um, is just a pile of dirt with some flecks of paint on it. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so that's it. Uh, I was kind of initially trained as a pa painter, 
and then I went into ceramics and well actually before I even went into painting I really didn't think I had the intellect to be a painter so um, I, I was a cartoonist I thought I could do better as a cartoonist so all of those things just kind of co come back around all the time and it's kind of like a pendulum swing also with you know humor and things that are kind of more more on the darker side there's a sort of pendulum where sometimes my work gets very serious and very dark and it goes to a point where it's just it's just too much and so then it swings back and then it becomes silly and then stupid and then it swings back, you know. So, um, uh, you know, the same thing with painting and sculpture, you know, like sometimes I just feel more in the mood to make things sculpturally um, and investigate things that way. And sometimes I just feel more like painting and I want to investigate things that way. So, uh, I, think, I think that's really one thing that's very important for me to always make things that I like. Um, when I get confused, when I don't know what I want to make, then you know, the question comes back to me, well, what would you like to make? What would you like to see? What would you like to have? Um, a lot of times I'll just go on eBay and I'll look at things that I wish I could buy and I make them. Um, so, stuff like that. Yes? I'm, I may not understand the material all that well, but I'm just curious about how do you get these pieces from one place to another? Yeah, that's like a very popular question. Yeah, yeah it's, it's okay. Awesome. No, that's <laughs> it's fine. Um, uh, so, like the cars, actually, it's interesting because the cars and the cellos and the and the piano and stuff like that, like those bigger things, they're made where I have this sort of wooden structure underneath it, and then uh, wire is sort of stapled to the wooden structure, and then. Uh, the clay is mixed with glue and in some cases even cement. Cement's not really so much of a binder, but I liked it for color, you know? And so the clay is just stuck to that wire and it's stuck to itself. And it, it was clay impregnated with glue? Yeah, it was kind of literally, I would like work with a bucket of glue, like wood glue, and then I would have a bucket of dried cement and then I would have a bucket of sloppy clay and my hand would just go in the bucket of clay and then roll it around in the cement a little bit and then roll it around in glue and then put it on my piece. And, um, so it's got something that's hanging on to and the cars I would always build in sections. So they come apart. Um, the, the low rider that I made was probably the smartest one I made because I actually even built all the sections onto a pedestal that went back together and looked like a platform, but they, there were wheels on each of the sections and I, I can just roll the things around. Um, but actually the things that I make more recently, the small things, the comic books, they're just hanging out there with nothing holding them together but prayers and, and hope. And, um, sometimes I will glue a piece of cloth or something like that to the back so that like if it does break, it at least holds it together so that it doesn't fall, break too much more. And then I, I also a lot of times have to repair these things and um, if they're sold and they break, you know, a lot of times they will come back to me you know, or repair them. I don't repair them to look like seamless because I can't. I haven't figured it out yet exactly. So they'll have a scar, um, but I really like the fact that it it's sort of a testament to what it is, and um, and a sort of life that has been lived. Is it, is it about sort of the vulnerability and fragility of, of not firing the play? Something That's something I'm. Yeah, I'm really interested in that, and I'm also interested in the you know particular value that something has. You know where where. Um, uh, so if you, if you have something in the world that is meant to uh, that will last forever, is that does that intrinsically have more value than something that lasts ten minutes? Um, and that and if you have something that is in danger of not being in the world, you know, like uh, um, 
in danger of being broken very easily, does that make it more valuable or does that make it less valuable? Um, you know, and then and then of course what I'm literally making is I'm painting dirt. And, and dirt intrinsically has no value. It's, I mean, but it does. We fight wars over it, and we, I mean, so, and and I'm, I'm, you know, painting it, and so, and if I were to take a clump of dirt, a clump of clay, and just paint a smiley face on it, does that have more or less value? If I paint, you know, an eloquently painted uh, comic book. Um, more or less, you know, so I'm just kind of making all these rhymes out of all these ways of thinking about what we value and how we value things. Um, yeah. Well, it, I use um, just mostly acrylic paints. Um, early on when I started to, um, to paint the books, you know, I was really using everything, so there's like, there's acrylic paint and then ink and sometimes even marker that it was kind of, it's kind of a pity because the marker fades faster than, and it goes away so fast, and I would just see beautiful drawings that I did just disappear, <laughs> and, um, but that's, a, that's part of it, you know, I kind of, I'm willing to sort of accept that, but I don't really make so many drawings with marker anymore. And then I would also like uh, like to color the surfaces sometimes to make it look like stains that happened, and I would paint like wood stains over the top of things um, just to make it look like a, a watermark or something like that. Yeah. So, and then I, at some point I was trying, you know, like the wood stain was making a shine, so I wanted to take the shine down, and so I would put like a kind of uh, talc over the top of the, and then brush it off. But then over time, it's just sort of clouded the pieces. So there's a lot of pieces where, at the time, it looked good, but now it's becoming much more cloudy, going away. In some of my which pieces? In some of your just the thinner pieces, such as um, oh, like your playing cards and stuff like that. No, it's just it's just um, I actually choose clay not according to like how strong it might be, but I choose it according to the color because um, there's a there's a, a brown clay that I use that dries kind of and it when it dries it looks almost exactly like cardboard or the kind of like card stock <coughs> that you use to make a, a book cover. And so I will sand away a lot of the drawing that I make and I, I, I need that color of the clay to kind of shine through. There's red clays that I use just because I like the color underneath. Um, but paper clay I, I haven't used. And, and again, like my point isn't really trying to keep these things in the world. It's just trying to make them with um, things, other things that I think are important for the for the work. Yeah. 